this is the iOS Top 10 talk. This will be probably the second last time that I actually ever give an iOS Top 10 talk uh, until 2020 because everyone's seen the iOS Top 10 talks. And I hope to actually um, talk about something slightly different today and we'll get onto that. So who am I? I have been here forever. I am part of the furniture. I did not start OWASP. I know who did, and I know who was in Mark's apartment, and it wasn't me, okay? So at the end of the day, basically, I was an early executive director. It was a volunteer position at the time. I worked on the developer guide from 2003 until 2005, literally until two hours before I got into the plane to go to Black Hat to present it. That was interesting. Uh, that was top 10, 2007 and I'll get into the reasons why I didn't do the 2010 and 2013 ones in a little bit. Uh, OS is happy for PHP, and I apologize in advance for that one, or actually apologize for 2009 and for that one. PHP does not do Unicode, and so therefore it will never pass unit tests, and so therefore it had to be abandoned. Um, that's just one of those things. Uh, and of course, I've been working on the application security verification standard since uh, 2009 and until now, and hopefully we'll get 3.1 out the door soon. And of course, the OS Top 10 2017, I'm a board member. So if you've got any issues regarding governance and leadership at OS, please come and see me. I think I'm one of the only board members here today. Um, I will be here today and a little bit tomorrow morning. Okay, so this has probably been the rockiest release we've ever had. It, uh, to put it mildly, we've, we've had a bit of a genesis. We can't stop here. This is backcountry. <laughs> so this is actually how not to interact with a project. There was a lot of social media that was very, very negative, and it actually ended up with the uh, founding leadership leaving the OS Top 10. And to put it mildly, this was not a good time. Um, Honestly, the social media pylon was just extraordinary, continuous, and extremely aggressive, and for the most part, completely useless. Because it was basically saying, yeah, I was top 10 is sucky, and blah, 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 these guys are conflicted, blah, 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 it's a failure to buy a tool, blah, blah, blah. The reality is it was the worst thing I've ever seen at OWASP. So please, if you're going to interact with a project, provide decent, constructive advice. Even if it's the sort of advice that says, I think you are completely wrong, and these are the reasons why. And I'll show you the reasons why that's actually really important. It's not OS-like. The original RC1 came out, we had a lot of feedback. Some of it valid, some of it not. Um, A7 for monitoring and A A10 for API protection boiled. Many people felt it boiled down to you didn't buy a tool, which, by the way, one of the OS top 10 founders by the way, had a product along that line. Honestly, who here thinks it's okay in this time and age that you wouldn't monitor an application? I don't see a single hand go up. Okay, so they're valid. Are they valid the way they were written? Constructive criticism might have got us across the line. However, now, we did have some really good feedback, both from John Stephen, who turned out to be in the organization I joined in June. So my second day was John Stephen and I on a phone call. He's saying, I've got a blog entry. You're not going to like it. And so we had to agree to disagree. But the thing is, is that his blog entry was really constructive. It actually let us go forward to figure out what we needed to change to make it good. And so that was actually a valid piece of criticism. It was long. It was huge. He used difficult words. Um, but at the end of the day, basically, it was the best thing we could possibly have because it provided us, this is what's wrong, this is what you need to fix. Did we accept every single one of those suggestions? No, we didn't. But we basically needed that sort of help. We also had problems with data quality. And Brian Glass, one of our co-leads, he actually uh, provided a two-part blog entry that did more data analysis than the original OS Top 10 RC1 had. And it was really good analysis. It delved deep into the data that was available. It showed that the data wasn't sufficient. It also showed us the way forward. And you know what? Brian ended up as a co-leader of the project. Can you see the difference between saying, this is crap, and now you're a co-lead? This is what I'm trying to say. We really need people to, you know, we're a volunteer-run organization. I really need people to say, I'm going to help with projects. 
I want to volunteer for that. It's not, you know, we're not just about chapters or conferences. I mean, they're great, but we're also about projects. And if we can get more volunteers for projects to make them better, awesome. Okay, so I'm going to skip this. We've got so many slides. Unfortunately, as I said, Dave and Jeff, the original uh, OWASP founders, um, uh, not OWASP founders, but the top 10 founders, uh, stood down and I got a call really late at night. Um, I was still in Australia at the time and Dave said, look, I'm going to step down. I really want you to look after it. And I knew that at that point I needed help. So what I did is I looked through the contributors who'd been helping the OWASP top 10 forever. Neil Smithline has been participating since 2004. So if anything, him being elevated to a co-lead was well overdue. Torsten has been doing the tr German translation, and if you've been reading the wiki version of the OWASP Top 10 since 2010, that's, that's Torsten's work, okay? So those folks, no-brainer, easy to actually justify. And as soon as they got appointed, they, we basically worked out that we needed Brian because we didn't have the data analysis skills to really figure out what we needed. Then we had the Project Summit. Um, the Project Summit was still um, going to happen. Dave was very kind and was a moderator of the Project Summit. And so one of the criticisms that was leveled at the OWASP Top 10 prior to RC1 is that it sort of popped out of nowhere. And that's only true if you don't follow the development. What we tried to do at the D Project Summit was actually help mitigate some of those issues. So how do we actually develop the OWASP Top 10? What qualifies for getting in? And so there was a couple of outcomes. Uh, we aimed for a release in 2017 and we did that. We also agreed to reopen the data core because we didn't have 2016 data. So essentially, um, if we'd gone live with the 2015 data, I still think it would have been a bit wrong. So we needed more data. And Brian really helped us get that done. We also reopened, we opened a new survey. And the survey, we basically decided there was going to be two forward-looking issues. And some people are really upset with us because they really want us to talk about the impact based upon breaches. But the reality is, I stuck in CRSF into the OWASP Top 10 2007 because 100% of applications had CRSF in 2007. 100%. So we stuck it in because it was important. So we're going to always reserve up to two spots, one or two, that aren't supported by the data at all. And we've got those. Um, we also agreed to work completely in the open in GitHub, and you can see that. You can see who contributed. You can see actually... Uh, those folks who submitted a ticket to get something fixed. So instead of providing silent feedback and then it suddenly changes and no one's got an idea of what actually happened there, everything's completely open. So if you've got a problem with the OWASP Top 10 2017, log an issue and we'll fix it. That's as simple as it gets. So the data call, we talked about that a little bit. We got 500 plus responses to the survey. We got a whole bunch of data and I really, 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 really appreciate everyone submitting their data. We had over 43 submissions, of which 20 plus were actually um, had enough um, data points for us to be able to use. Um, we had some problems where some of the folks who were doing automated assessments and those who were doing static code analysis had different things and so many things it was overwhelming um, some of the other inputs from, say, for example, small boutiques. And the small boutique consultancies the quality of the findings is incredible. The breadth of the findings, the number of CWEs hit, is incredible. And so we didn't want to lose that data. And so Brian's job was actually to try and get um, uh, that balance right. So if you're actually wondering how we game it up with the weighting, we've got the Excel spreadsheet there. If you're wondering what the source data was, it's in GitHub. You can download that data. And so if you run a, se a security consultancy, you can actually use that data to compare yourself against 114,000 other applications. And you can say, am I doing a good job or am I doing a bad job? And then up, up those skills. So we're still analyzing all this data and that's probably going to go through to 2020 because realistically we need to have a different design for 2020. Um, historically, the OWASP top 10 has always looked backward. These are the things that security researchers found last year. But that's actually not important, because if you think about it, in, 20, uh, in 2012, it was all about hacktivism. In 2016, it was all about credentials and automation attacks, basically, credential stuffing and whatnot. If we were 
designing the OS Top 10 to be about, um, you know, more or less the things that happened last year, it would be out of date the second we published. And that was always the problem with the methodology of the OS Top 10. And so we've tried to fix that. And when we do the 2020 version, I would really appreciate it if you guys could actually start doing some sort of automation around your um, uh, you know, pen test results so you can actually submit as well. Okay. Now, we can make it an anonymous submission. We didn't have time this year to do that, um, but I would certainly suggest I would like to have more than 114,000 apps as our sample size. So any time that I get information back from someone who says the OS top 10 is not valid because we don't have enough data is wrong. This is the largest sample of data out there at full stop. And more importantly, just before we actually started to finish up the uh, OS top 10, Bug Crowd submitted their data. And that was a huge thing. It was so brave of them. Because um, it actually gives you a little bit of a clue about their business. But the important thing is Bug Crowd has triaged every one of those bugs the customer of Bug Crowd has actually paid out either a t-shirt or some money to get those results. And it agreed with our analysis. That is an amazing, like, you know, you've got the best people in the world working on bug bounties, including, you know, some folks who do nothing else but look at one class of bugs. So a friend of mine who now works for Apple, he basically found nothing but XXEs and, and 250K in a year getting XXEs. So the reality is we had real specialists who were, you know, bug crowd, thank you. Thank you so much. And we also appreciate everybody else who contributed data. Okay, what does it say? Well, <laughs> the reality is passive findings are overwhelmingly towards the top. But is that going to be A1? We had to think about that because, you know, realistically, SQL injection is now less than 5% of every um, like of the total number of findings. But it, it really comes down to the impact. So things you can find through SSL labs or passive findings in Burp um, or securityheaders.io, those things, are you really going to get hacked by having a weak certificate or a self-signed certificate? Probably not. Um, if you had no certificate, yeah, maybe. Um, so we actually looked at this and we tried to actually work out what is it we're going to say. Um, because the data, and you can see there, that XXE, which is one of the new OS top 10s, had enough data by itself to get in by itself. It didn't need help. Okay, so we'll talk about that in a bit. But this is actually really interesting because, you know, we, we selected the number of CWEs pretty much at random based around what we felt were the most popular 40 CWEs and in the MVD data. And we were worried that we hadn't asked you for a CWE that could be really impactful. And that's the problem with the methodology, and that's something we'll have to fix in 2020. How do we make sure that we get all the CWEs to see whether or not it's impactful? Because this is not the list. You'll see that. And so one of the things that did come up and you've got to remember, when we were doing this, the um, Equifax hack had just happened. And um, I am aware that a couple of people from Yahoo are here today, and I apologize in advance. Um, but also the, the fact that every single account at Yahoo was breached, not just some of them. And obviously this is not great. Um, so this was on the top of people's minds. But the reality is, finally, people are testing for access control. And this is a really important thing. So we need to make sure that we've covered that off. And so we basically started weighting it and the number of responses that occurred. And it started becoming a bit clearer that once you actually themed these things up, we started to get certain categories of findings, which sadly, in some ways, is the old OWASP top 10. SQL injection didn't move. Access control moved up a bit, but cross-site scripting went down a bit, but they're still in the OS top 10. If you think about the OS top 10 as being, this is the bare minimum you can do, then essentially it's the 10 things that you really need to fix. And does it matter if it's in one or 10? No, not really. So one of the problems we've got here is that this is about what to do, you know, what not to do. You can tell developers there's like a thousand things not to do. But there's only really about 13 or 40 things that you want them to do. And 
enterprise architecture still role, um, has a role to play there, but also leading practices. So if you're actually interested as to um, how come this has ended up in this way, and then for um, what is the order of the OS top 10, you've got to realize that we've got to talk about the ASVS and proactive controls. If you're after a security standard, you really need to use those other actual standards. This is an awareness piece of the bare minimum to avoid negligence. There's a big difference there. So the OS top 10 is used on a regular basis because it's easy. There's only 10 things. Um, most of it is surface, like you, you can get it through a pen test, most of it. Um, and so that's an important element. And so the ordering. Um, Dave really wanted to keep the same order. And this is an actually an interesting point. Do we keep the same order if it exists? So keeping cross-site scripting at number three or whatever it was. And the answer is, well, I didn't know and I wanted to find out. So I asked on Twitter how to actually work it out. And the vast majority of you wanted to have risks. In fact, risks outweighed all the other responses put together, so it was an easy decision. But what's a risk? A risk is likelihood, which we had, times impact, which we don't. And so this is a bit of a problem. I mean, we're, we're coming up with a risk rating here that's not a really a risk because we can't guess how you use it. Someone who uses SharePoint for like a, a wiki or something that's internal and has no sensitive data, that's like if you compromise that SharePoint, no big deal. And many SharePoints are actually on the internet in read-only mode, and that's fine. Um, but if you use SharePoint to store health data and that's a heavily protected part of your um, ecosystem, that's usually a big deal. So same app very different risk ratings. So we want to understand that a little bit more, and I think that's actually something we need to work on in 2020. There's something we couldn't get to this time around. So the road to release. We basically had a lot of things going on. Um, we basically had two more releases, the RC2, which is the first version that actually exposed what we are going to have as our top 10 list in the order that we were going to have it. At that point, we were basically really certain of our data, the, the data that we had, that is. Um, the wording, how we expressed ourselves, the recommendations, that was all up for grabs at that point. We needed to make sure that the community was on board with it, and so it was an interesting one. So everything is in GitHub. You can see it there. The data call has all the data. If you want to reanalyze that data, go for it. This is how we get to a place where um, we start to be reproducible. We want to make sure that you can disagree with this if you like, but if the data is there, hmm, okay. You can have opinions, but facts don't care about your opinion. We want to get to that place. We need to be reproducible. We need to be a bit more scientific about this because we only have 10 spots. We need to make sure that we use them properly. The other thing is that we need to make sure that the issues are uh, traceable. So say, for example, someone logs an issue and we actually take care of it. So how does that get into the text? We actually worked in Markdown. And that made it really easy to actually identify uh, what text has changed, and that made it a lot easier to translate. So you can already see that we have English, French, Hebrew, Japanese, and Korean, and now we've got a few others as well. This is amazing. We've never had so many translations finished so early, and that's because not only did we make sure the translators know that there was something coming up, we also worked with them to make sure that Markdown was available to them so they could start the translation effort before we got going. And because they could see what changed, they could actually, with confidence, do the PowerPoint version of it, which, by the way, hopefully in 2020 we'll be using PowerPoint for the actual <laughs> final version. Um, it made it really s simple for them to say, well, that text changed in the English version. I need to update my translation of that one sentence instead of uh, retranslating the entire page. And that's a huge benefit for them. RC2, we actually closed 125 issues in four months, but you can sort of see it spiked uh, roughly around September to October. Uh, it was more of a rewrite than, in, than anything else. We looked at every single word. We basically rejigged it. Uh, we re reordered it slightly. We included a difference. The exposure of sensitive data has often been misconstrued as, oh, you tell us that the header here is that you're running Apache. That is not sensitive. Okay, so we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, XXC got in there by itself. Deserialization is chosen by the community, and it's a worthy inclusion. It could, have b it might be the root cause or one of the root causes behind one of the biggest hacks of 2017. Uh, insufficient logging and monitoring. We're basically saying you need 
to bring down the number of days that you're compromised and you need to detect it. That seems pretty reasonable. So if you look at the Verizon um, uh, data breach report, it's been basically static for the number of years. It has gone down from less than like just on two years down to 192 days. But 192 days is not great. And the vast majority of people who tell you that you've been breached are external parties. And so that's also not great. So we really need to get to a place where we're actually in charge of our destinies. And that includes logging and monitoring. And we'll talk about how to actually do that in a tick. The Golden Master, we did 121 issues in three weeks. I didn't sleep much. My sleep is terrible at the rest of times, but that is a lot of work. <laughs> Um, we actually closed out very substantial issues and in fact we actually got a complete rewrite of AA, the deserialization from Chris Frohoff and um, uh, Gabriel Lawrence, uh, the guys who came up with the deserialization attacks and why so serial. So those guys actually wrote that section, which is fantastic. We want more of that. Uh, we're specialists in the, that area, help peer review it or rewrite it. Okay, so that's awesome. We also did a test fit for PowerPoint because it's really easy to write 2,000 words. It's really hard to write 600. So we actually had about 140 words per section of the, of the document. And getting the distilled essence of what we wrote in Markdown into PowerPoint, <laughs> yeah. In the final release, we did 82 issues in one week. Yeah, I didn't sleep then either. <laughs> Uh, we definitely moved We moved from Markdown to PowerPoint at that point because we didn't allow anything other than essential typos um, to be fixed at that point. Um, we also kicked off translation and then it was released and it was awesome. The timing could have been better. It was the Thanksgiving week. That is a good lesson to be learnt for 2020. Do not release in Thanksgiving. Okay? That is like number one. Don't release in Thanksgiving. I would actually like to see it released at AppSec USA in 2020. I think that's a good time. It actually coincides with a bit of press, and I think it coincides with people being around. And I think, honestly, it'd be good, good to aim for that. <laughs> it's too early in the year. It takes time to do this properly. No, I agree, though. <laughs> it's awesome. Okay, so what's new? Okay, so these are the things. We're going to basically skip this. You can get it. Um, we have a slightly different format than previous years. We've really concentrated on... How are you vulnerable? So this is if you're a pen tester, you need to test for this. If you're a developer, you need to write tests around this. How to prevent. This is for developers, how to fix it. So it's not about um, folks basically getting in there and um, uh, putting in WAF rules or anything like that. We need people to fix the code. And so that's basically our best advice at this very moment on how to prevent. We've provided some attack scenarios there. And um, I'll let you know there's an Easter egg in there, and the first person who finds it, I will uh, get an iTunes voucher for them. So <laughs> let's just say there's a, it's a quite a good one. Um, anyway, and then we've got references. And for the first time, we actually link to cheat sheets, proactive controls, and ASVS, as well as the CWEs. So this is actually really important. The vast majority of security tools have now settled on CWE as being the index. Okay, so ASVS will actually start to relink, or actually link with CWE, even though we're a positive model and the CWE is a weakness. Um, the top 10 is all about weaknesses, so you know what? If you're a pen tester and you're wondering, how do I update my uh, skills and whatnot? Make sure you cover off every one of those CWEs, and then call it that CWE when you write your reports, and then we can figure out if you comply with the OS top 10 or not. Um, honestly, this stuff is interesting. So if you want to know how we ended up scoring things, this is basically the top bit here. Exploitation of deserialization is somewhat difficult, blah, blah, blah. And then prevalence and detectability, like how easy is it to get? And then the impact. And the impact can be anything from we've made you reboot your server to we can port scan you inside or we can use uh, internal uh, document reflection to get things out of you. I've talked about the application vulnerability and prevention. That's awesome. Attack scenarios and references. This is actually um, one of those areas where we basically help you figure out how to do it with different views. So the proactive controls is like the negative of the OS top 10, except for it's a completely positive uh, way of dealing with things. So if you want a simple, um, quick standard to comply with, 
proactive controls as your job. If you want the ASVS, that has three levels, um, level one, two, and three. You can choose whichever one you want. We also encourage people to fork it and then basically um, make it, it the, its own. Um, we also provide some background information and that's actually really helpful. So say for example, you don't understand it, even after we've written all of this, you can go click the links and there's some good um, links to presentations or background material, okay? So uh, SQL injection, no surprise that it's number one. Uh, it's just the impact is off the um, charts. We've seen a lot of NoSQL injection, um, primarily in encrypting complete databases. So most people are actually now on top of that because they've had the databases encrypted once. Uh, yeah, but you know, we, we've included it. Um, so I'm just going to show you the demos. Come on, you can do it. Oh, it's done it as a little tiny thing on the corner there. Um, it's SQL injection. Everyone sees SQL injection. Um, this is the OWASP juice shop, by the way, which if you haven't played with it yet, is one of the best vulnerable apps. It's written in <coughs> Angular and has a Node.js background, has 50 odd exercises, all of them modern and it has a CTF mode and it actually has a learning mode. So essentially you can teach yourself um, the five different levels of attack. Um, it's actually really cool. Um, they've, g uh, they've done unit tests. It's actually the most bug-free vulnerable application in existence. <laughs> it passes all the unit tests. Okay, so uh, in a2, we are now talking about anti-automation. So credential stuffing, we are talking about NIST 800-63. So stop testing for password complexity. Please stop. You now need to test for um, the length of passwords. They should be a minimum of 12 if they have two-factor and a minimum of 16 if they don't have two-factor. And you're probably going, what the but that's NIST 800-63. To give you an idea of how little they think about passwords, it's in the second book on page 260 in section 5.1.1.1. And you know what? It, was, it took me a while to find out when they're actually going to talk about passwords. And the entire three-volume set is about authentication. They don't want you to use passwords anymore. Please stop. So two-factor authentication, pretty much mandatory at this point. Anti-automation, so because we've got 4 billion credentials floating out about there with the username and passwords. You don't need the dictionary attack. You don't have to GPU crack anymore. You look up a person's pass like password directly and log in. So passwords are done. They are done, 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 done. And so what I really needed to do, in fact, it's going to do this again, isn't it? It's going to put this in a little video here in that little tiny window. That's terrible. Um, so... Yes, that's a dictionary attack, that video there. Um, the reality is dictionary attacks are interesting, but I'm much more interested about credential stuffing. So you need to bring it up. You need to actually look at the way that we've rewritten the OS Top 10 uh, A2 and start testing for those better things. Um, also think about two-factor authentication in terms of business logic. Um, can you use a token to authenticate to a different account? Can you actually bypass two-factor authentication? Can password resets bypass two-factor authentication? You need to be testing the functional aspects of two-factor. Uh, just breaking in because you have a very fast connection to the server, yeah. Okay, so sensitive data exposure is about sensitive, private, health, financial data. Pretty much anything you can get in trouble for, uh, regulatory-wise, compliance-wise, or legal-wise, we care about, okay? So S3 buckets get a mention here. Now, Amazon is well on its way to fixing that problem, okay? But in anyone who actually explicitly shares a bucket with the wrong permissions, because they think that the bucket name is somehow magical and special, um, that can still be a problem. And there's other cloud services as well, but obviously we talk about S3 buckets. We also talk about ways that you can actually do the attacks. So essentially we're looking at um, uh, exposing records. Let me just get my mouse pointer. Uh, yep. So effectively what we're trying to do here is um, we're trying to get to a place where people are testing for access to other people's data. And we're not just talking about read access. If you can change an account like you can update someone's password and then log in as them, that's terrible too, okay? Um, if you're in a health system and you say this person is crazy because you're allowed to update someone else's record, 
That's terrible. So we want to make sure that we get to a place where we are testing the functional aspects of access control for creation, read, update, and delete, and anything else that might expose bulk information. Okay, so it's way different. Um, so this is basically an account takeover because the password can be reset for someone else's account. Okay, that's terrible. You shouldn't be able to reset someone else's account. So um, XXE got in by itself. One of the biggest things, though, this was only in SAS data. It wasn't in DAST, which means no one's testing for it. Okay, so what we really need to do is, and uh, interestingly enough, the bug crowd actually had the most amount of um, XXE findings of anyone. And so what we really need people to do is learn how simple XXE is. Let me just kick that off, because this is one of the shortest videos in the entire uh, compilation. Um, yes, I prepared the file earlier, but anyone can prepare an XML file and just have it handy. Um, so effectively, you know, file upload features, we'd be probably be testing for can we run an arbitrary Merck command, like put up, you know, a JSP or something. But, you know, we're going to submit an XML and see what happens. So it's going to try and get the password file out of it. And uh, yeah, it went well. We've accepted that, ex uh, that particular thing. And then we look at the response. And yep, so the request is all good. What's the response say? Yep, there's the password file. That is how simple it is to exploit XXE. If you really want the file from it, you might need to set up a victim server, like you know, an attack server. But you know what? That's not a high bar. OK. Broken access control. We're now extending it from just IDOR and functional level access control, i.e. controllers. Um, we need to go to pre force browsing, presentation layer access control, uh, particularly um, model layers. So essentially, um, do I have permissions to create, read, write, and delete this particular record that's owned by someone else? When I see code, and I do a fair number of code reviews, I often see the models being one line long. And those lines don't often have a join in there to make sure that the ownership of the record is enforced. We need to actually start testing for that. Because what happens is that when you go to microservices, they're now exposed. And it's like having a SQL server on the internet because you know how to drive a RESTful API to get all the data out. So please, model layer access control and domain access control, business logic. Um, one of the things that I tested for um, in 2015 was a. Um, is anyone here from Oracle? I'm going to apologize in advance. Um, there was a really interesting app. And I'm not going to tell you which one it is, because they have 3,000 apps, and so you can leave your guessing, because I don't know if they've fixed it. Um, this app is used by infrastructure. Let's call it infrastructure. It's 16 years old at that point in time. It would have been pen tested hundreds of times. And I could access admin functionality without being logged in. Yeah. I. It blows my mind that so many people would have pen tested that because it's infrastructure, if you get my meaning, um, that no one tested access control. We need to step up our access control testing. You know what? It's not automatable. So we need the developers to do this. We need you guys to help the developers write good integration tests because it's functional testing. And we need to get on with that. OK, security misconfiguration. This is the bucket list for everything that's passive. And I would actually like it very much if everyone stopped reporting these with a risk rating because, yeah, you're running Apache. Hmm, big deal. It's actually much more important about A9, which is uh, running vulnerable components, okay? It's not really important about what you call it because plenty of people disable that header and you're still vulnerable. Okay, so every passive finding is A6. And I honestly think, you know, we need to actually just simply say, here's some hygiene things you should fix. Don't risk rate it. Just simply say, here's the bucket list. Here's the 10 or 15 things that's wrong. Because we should be spending our times in pen test reports, in actually doing consulting, helping our people be better at security. The only reason it's this high, because its impact is negligible, is because it's the most common vulnerability. It's so much more than everybody else. XXS, everybody knows XSS but we've talked about DOM XSS explicitly. We need you to start testing for DOM XSS. If you don't know anything about DOM XSS, learn. It's not hard. It just requires better skills. Um, you need to know what it sources are. You need to know syncs. You need to get yourself a plugin that will actually do some little bit of JavaScript inspection to actually understand how it works. 
um, and to find those sources and sinks and then learn how to actually do it. It's not that hard. And the problem is DOM XSS doesn't go through a firewall. It happens on the browser. And so you don't even know it's happened, and yet it's got exactly the same impact as either a reflected or restored cross-site scripting, depending on how it's actually invoked. Okay, insecure deserialization. I have talked about this already. Um, let's just click this, this video while we're talking about it. And so this is an API, and basically we're going to have a serialization attack. Um, anyone who leaves their swagger in production is all good. Um, and so this one's just going to do a DOS uh, to stop the server from responding for a period of time. Um, and so we're going to steal an authentication header from a, a good request, and then we're just going to do the XXC, sorry, the deser deserialization. You're not going to find it very often. I actually think deserialization is going to be with us forever. Once people learn how easy it is and how often folks who are writing back end code, they don't want to have state on back-end code because then it becomes not functional programming anymore. And so what happens is they ship that state around, and that state is actually very sensitive. And so once you learn what serialization looks like and how to attack it, it's actually really interesting because now you've got remote com command execution on the remote server. And that's not the only thing. If it's an object that's not necessarily exploitable in that way, you might be able to change yourself from being a user to an admin or get to be someone else. Um, so these things are actually rather interesting. So um, just in the interests of time, I will make sure all of these videos are uploaded so you can watch them all. They're mostly between 10 seconds and 40 seconds long. Um, and so in this case, it's going to require me to do some cut and pasting to get this right. And yeah, this is why I think this, although it'll be with us forever, may not necessarily be always exploitable because you have to get the syntax right. So if you remember the days when syntax um, was a real big deal when you're doing SQL injection like 15 years ago and you had to do it by hand, yeah? Blind SQL injection was basically known, but you couldn't really do it because there were no good tools. We're at that point right now with deserialization because the gadgets that YSO Serial produces are very specific to certain builds. Okay, so we need to learn how to do it. Um, okay, I'm just going to go forward because we are running out of time. Okay, known vulnerable components, unfortunately, is still with us, and this is actually really surprising. Um, we really need the CICD folks to step up and say, we are going to break the build if it has a vulnerable component. We are going to warn the developers that there is a problem if there's an out-of-date component. What happens is that if you leave this go, and you, don't, you, you know this is a problem, but you don't actually update it, it creates technical debt. I went to one client late last year, and they have components that are like three or four years old, and it's got security vulnerabilities up the wazoo, and they do two or three releases a year. And the problem with this is, is that they're going to basically do nothing for like three or four months, but update their components. And then they'll still be out of date at the end of that unless they fix the process. So we need to start fixing the process. I really want this out of the OS top 10 because it shouldn't be a thing. If we're doing agile, DevOps, whatever it is, this should not be a thing. The OS dependency checker um, is really good. Um, for those of you who have never seen it in action, this is basically looking at the juice shop uh, for node.js. Now, there is an NSP check, which you can also do, but it's not as good as OS dependency check. Even though this is a beta function, experimental function of dependency check, it does it for PHP, it does it for Node, it does it for Ruby, it does it for Java, it does it for JavaScript. Please start using it. It's really impressive. It's really awesome. And you can see there, if I saw that particular report coming out in XML, I, you can actually ask dependency check to put out a um, status code of fail above a CVSS level. So you can say, is, is it above 6.0? Break the build. Absolutely. We need to get to the place now where we're breaking the build. So NSP check, which is another thing you can do with JavaScript with Node.js, only found like one item. Um, uh, yep, thank you. Um, so I really want to make sure that we can retire this in three years. Help our our industry out by getting rid of this problem. I really want to see, like SQL injection went downhill really fast as soon as people did frameworks properly. 
we really need our, our folks to start building in an engineering fashion. Okay. Insufficient logging and monitoring. I'm going to spend a tiny bit of time here because it's important, because it's a, it's a control. In fact, it's a missing control. So in auditing circles, there's the idea of, is the control present? Is it in use? And is it effective? So even if you have Splunk, if your security things aren't saying, I'm a security event, I can be searched for and create a dashboard, you've got logs. You don't have artificial ignorance to get rid of all the other logs. You need to be able to do something that allows your tools that you have to highlight the problems that you definitely have. So it's not a matter of if you get hacked, it's when you get hacked and then can you detect it. So the way that I want to go forward with this is basically, if you're a, a, a security consultancy, when you do a pen test, ring the client up. And then, I know this is shocking. You talk to the client. Did you detect me? If you didn't detect me, you need to fix things. If you did detect me, would that have actually started your incident management process? And then more importantly, does your incident management process allow you to continue even though you're being hacked? Because imagine if Amazon turned off every time that someone tried to hack them. It, it's not okay. We wouldn't, we wouldn't accept that today. So as much as we try to say that we want you to have an incident response framework, NIST 800-61 Rev 2 basically says turn it off, isolate it, forensically image it. Yeah, that's not going to happen. We need to have a modern version of 800-61, okay? And you need to be aligned with your business. Translations, please, we've only got those ones right now. I'd really like to see a Vietnamese version. I'd really like to see um, your local language here, okay? As many translations as possible. Even if only one person reads it, then that makes a difference. That's awesome. Um, and as I said, Almost every single document I have ever, have ever done at OWASP has a cat-related Easter egg. This is the cat-related Easter egg in this particular deck, but the OWASP Top 10 actually has a different cat-related Easter egg, and I'm, I dare you to find it. Um, okay, so time to upskill and continuously improve. Honestly, I want you to start thinking about the OWASP Top 10 as being the minimum list to avoid getting sued for negligence, okay? It's the absolute bare minimum. If you need to do something more, you want to do an AppSec program, it's not the right choice. I'm saying that to you as the OS Top 10 leader. You need to choose the ASVS. You need to choose the Cloud Security Alliance. You need to choose the proactive controls because you cannot review yourself to security. And I'm, I'm going to apologize again. Security needs to become part of the development team. Okay. If we sit to the side and say that we're somehow better than everybody else when we've signed the exact same employment agreements as everybody else, they, we can't be approached. If we sit on a different floor, the developers don't have the choice of talking to you about something they've noticed or they want help with. If you actually make yourself the person who communicates bad news to them in such an offensive way, they don't like dealing with you, then you're the computer says no. We need to enable secure business. In 2005, I worked on a corporate uh, internet banking project where we basically had a business requirement to, uh, if they had $2 billion in the account, they could transfer $2 billion. If we had 40,000 transactions for a pay run, it could, had to allow that to happen. And this is the internet in 2005. And so I came up with a solution for that. And you know what? We evaluated a whole bunch of products. We did transaction signing, which is something you don't see very often, but it's really important. The thing was, that was such a huge competitive advantage that we got a lot of other clients to come to us because we could do things that other banks were still accepting nine-track tape for, like pay runs. You know, this is like 2005, so it's a while ago. So we could do things on the internet with billions of dollars because we invested in security that enabled secure business. It is a competitive advantage. And to be there, you need to be part of the development team. We cannot be there right at the end. We cannot be telling people that the baby is very ugly. If you're a separate security team, you're doing it wrong. Please get embedded. You need to update your skills. You need to update your test plans because obviously we've retired a few things. Um, I know unvalidated redirects and forwards was a very popular item, but the reality is that the data is just not there for it anymore. 
And that's probably because the frameworks we now use don't have it really anymore. And so one of the problems is that if you're still testing for the OS top 10 2013, uh, you're not really testing for the impactful things, and I need you to start testing the impactful things. Okay. And update scan policies. If you write tools, if you're a tool vendor, please create an OS top 10 2017 um, policy. Please don't tell everyone you do the entire top 10 because you can't. A10 is untestable from a tool perspective unless you have some way of hooking in with your seam that reports back to your test tool, which is a way forward, but I don't see it happening. Okay. 2020, please, 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 please think about right now getting to a place where you can get statistics for your own needs, but then share it with us. Because if you know where your problems are because you're collecting statistics, you can say, well, I've been investing this many millions of dollars a year in my security team, and I don't have anything to show for it. Starting to get metrics helps you start building that, um, that thing of what's actually effective and what's not effective. And what I'd like to do is, once you actually do that for yourself, you can share it with us. And I'd love that. I want more than 114,000 apps next time. I want a lot more than 114,000 apps. And I would really like more bug bounty folks. I would like the internal security teams. I would love to get more data. Um, even if it's anonymous data, it's going to be fantastic. Um, we didn't have the option of doing anonymous data this time, but I would love to be able to do that, to be able to share more with you. Okay, thank you. If there's any questions, it's great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.